This is a Momentum Media production. Inside Commercial Property with Rethink Investing. Australia's largest and most comprehensive podcast covering all things commercial investing. Oh, good day. How are you going? It's Phil Tarrant here, co-host of Inside Commercial Property. Hope you're well uh, joined in the studio uh, live. Wednesday afternoon, Scott O'Neill, uh, Director, Founder, Rethink Investing. Scott, how are you going? I'm well, I'm well. Yeah, mate, how are you, Phil? All right, mate. We're streaming across the uh, the airwaves. That is uh, the Property Investment Podcast Network. You're probably also watching us or tuning into us on the YouTube or the Instagram. I know you're a big Instagrammer. You're always walking around with your shirt off. Uh, <laughs> you, you keep <laughs> saying that, mate. I, uh, now I'm all self-conscious. Oh, no, I can't help it, mate. Keep it's, those it's, photos away. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know... Uh, <laughs> The rig might look good sometimes, but maybe what's inside isn't that good. And a lot can be said. <laughs> a lot can be said as a metaphor for property investment, particularly commercial property, right now. It might look good. The bones might be right. It might be nice to look at, but deep down, it might not be a good asset. Yeah, it's a great intro, and I thought um, today would be a good day to just talk about when things go wrong. Mm. You know, like there's um, there's a lot of uh, good stories out there, and and I think it's important to share them, especially when things are mostly negative bias towards commercial out there. So we've covered that really well. But um, yeah, I was going to just share some stories. I've you know traveled around and bought and been involved in thousands of transactions so and seen many more than I'm not part of as well. So yeah, just, just going through uh, some of the things and, and lessons learned really. Yeah, and it's good. Um, uh, we've been uh, recording this podcast now. It's hugely popular, by the way. I think in many ways it's shaped... A lot of people's decisions um, uh, around investing property. It's funny. I was, I was, and and you may be tuning into this, and and you'll know who you are. I was at my local uh, bottle shop buying a a bottle of wine while I was waiting for my takeaway to cook the take home on. Uh, uh, I can't remember what day it was, but um, uh, it was a really nice lady behind me, and uh, she was also buying the said bottle of wine. She went and I went, oh look, yeah, here you go. And he goes, oh. How's your podcast going? And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> what podcast? She goes, oh, yeah, the commercial one. Um, so there's listeners all over the place, mate. And uh, I, I don't like the fact that I'm so recognisable these days. It makes me yeah. makes me a bit nervous. But I think a lot of people. And, and thank you um, uh, for the uh, the very positive sentiment around the, around the podcast. If you are tuning into this, um, but I reckon a lot of people have shaped their decision making around what they invest in and where because of what we've been talking about on this podcast for a couple of years. Now, that's really, really cool. However, we need to acknowledge the significance of that and the responsibility we have around it as well. It's not all beer and skittles investing in commercial property. And we've spoken about a lot of the positives of investing in commercial versus potentially resi uh, investment or uh, other asset classes. But we really need to highlight the fact that not everyone gets it right. A lot of people get it wrong. A lot of people get it really wrong. Hopefully, by tuning in this, you can try and mitigate where it does go wrong. But Getting it wrong in, in commercial property investment isn't necessarily always about poor yields, right? There's some it can go horrifically wrong if you get it really wrong. Exactly, and and one of the things I get asked when I go onto a different podcast, it's like a real entry level type intro into commercial. Is like they go, tell me the pros and cons, residential versus commercial, that kind of dialogue. And you normally just start with, oh yeah, vacancies are longer. Um, I always say, you know, the risks are higher, the rewards are higher too. Um, residential, you can know very little about what you're doing, but you've got that common sense touch because you, you live in a house. You can kind of understand people will rent a house because you understand living in a house. But commercial, you will get punished more if you make a bad call. And I think we can delve into that rather than just say it like a high level thing, which mm. is pretty much what only, you know the media talks about. So we can tell you what that actually means and and things I've seen out yeah. there and uh, there's lots of examples. You could talk for many hours, but um, there's solutions for most of this stuff too. So that's the key. Like if you are in one of these uh, situations, if you've overpaid for a property or you've got a tenant that's bailed on you or a, a, a baited up lease, like there are solutions. So we can sort of step by step. Through yeah, let's do that. And I don't want to beat this up too much. I don't want us to be the merchants of doom and gloom and you know negativity, right? But um. Uh, you will find that a lot of people's perceptions towards commercial property has probably shifted quite a lot in the last six months because the yields you were getting on super low interest rates are probably very different to the yields you're getting right now. And you know, we've spoken about it at length. Um, most people who have been investing in commercial property, if they've been taken on debt at seventy percent, are probably still cash flow positive. 
But I reckon there's a lot of people getting pretty close to the line on good assets um, into not negative territory, but neutral territory in terms of the gap between what you pay for your mortgage versus what income you get and everything else around it. So that that is like things not going as well as what they used to, but that's very different to things going fundamentally wrong. And, and you know, chatting to you offline, there's some people who have really got it wrong recently. Maybe that's where we start what really wrong looks like. Yeah, so... The ones that are the classic example of going wrong is is overpaying for a property and not knowing you've overpaid for it. So I'll give you an example, and this was bought by a property professional. So it was a it was a buyer's agency, one of those ones that sort of do resi mostly, and they've sort of had a crack at commercial. And it was a Anytime Fitness. I'm not going to say the location, but call it Southeast Queensland. I remember seeing it because it was online for a while. It was a it was about a three mil purchase seven and a half year lease on it looked great you know yield was seven percent the rest of the market at the time was about six so i was tempted i looked at it and immediately you go wow that rent looks high per square meter it was about 350 a square meter but comparables were less than 250 220 to be fair someone ended up buying i just walked at that point i went well you know that's too much risk the vow wouldn't stack up that was my immediate thought not worth the hassle even if the uh, tenant was good uh, within two months of settlement this tenant left so the, and i only looked at i went you know i was just looking at old ads and i saw there was a, a vacant lease ad and i went oh surely that was the the fitness first but uh, sorry the indian time fitness and it was gone so i calculated it's this this person involved would have probably overpaid by a mil one one point two to three mil overpaid for it overpaid in terms of the asset purchase yep, just because of the rent and and now it's vacant so it could be even less but it's only going to be worth less until you replace the tenant but you're not going to replace it at that same rent level so it's a dud unfortunately just due to uh, overpaying so unfortunately well, fortunately they're quite easy to, to see so as a trained professional even if you don't know what you're doing the first lesson is always check the rent square meter rates like you may remember phil the first thing we looked at when we're looking at your property, had a list of comparable rentals. And you could see your, your, your one was under-rented. And that de-risks it. That stops that situation happening. And it is, it's harder than you think because if you buy a childcare, how do you work out the comparable rents? Like it starts to get a little bit more clouded depending on the asset class and depending on the fit out. You know, our KFC is paying the fair rent. Um, you know, Coles and Woolworths all have sort of set rates, to, you know, off, off turnover amounts as well. So... It can be a lot more tricky than you think, but high level, just make sure you check the square meter rate because you don't want to be that guy that loses a million dollars for a dodgy tenant. So that's like apples for apples, right? Like that's where you can actually compare, you know, what the rent should be versus what it currently is on the lease. And if it's a gap, yep. north or south of that, it's a question mark. Yeah. And one of the things about residential is you, it's hard to do that. It's hard mm. to make a mistake that bad. Because you can kind of just look at what others are selling on the on the street, and even if you don't even understand general mathematics, you can get it. But mm. um, yeah, commercial these types of uh, scenarios are quite common, especially like with little cafes and stuff like that, where uh, their uncles, you know, related, and um, you know they pump the, the rent up because they know they're going to get a quick sale. They don't care if they lose their bond and get chased for money because you're probably not going to catch them in yeah. in many cases. So. So that's really wrong, would you say, or that's pretty good wrong? That that's about as bad as it gets. Okay, like it's because um, it's hard to fix that. The it's only really hard to fix it. So so the issue was that number one, the tenant was paying too much for the the the, the com comparable rent he was paying was too much versus what he should be paying, which probably put cash flow constraints on his business, which means he couldn't pay the bills and therefore probably went bust. Yeah. Or the rent was overinflated for the purpose of selling the asset to someone. Could have been both. Could have, Could been, have both. been the and yeah, you never know this. And it, like the longer I do this game, it, it's you know even when you you just don't know what happens behind closed doors. Yeah. What handshake agreements have been done? Like have they not disclosed how bad a business is going until after settlement? You know the classic example is. Um, maintenance you know you you get a builder out and he might know the owner and all like we had the one this is another little uh gotcha type of thing air conditionings um we see after settlement all of a sudden the big 10 grand bill comes in so i get many calls from clients going scott why didn't we find this uh bill out and, and we got a builder out to check it we even got an air con specialist and they mysteriously don't find the issue until after settlement it's like how convenient you know 
Who, and they know they're going to get a check from someone else, right? You know, get the pay to fix it. It's you've got to sit there and just go, oh, is it really that murky? You know, is it really that is there, is, there, is that many people with the wrong intent and has skullduggery who's going to try and stitch you up, trying to flog your commercial property? But back to this, um, is it any 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 time fitness was it? Yeah, any time fitness. So what's a recourse on the tenant with that? If he just goes, I'm out of here. You know, if it's a seven year lease, he's still got to pay the rent for seven years, right? Yeah, he filed bankruptcy. He was an individual operator. Mm. He lost his bond. Um, you know, he's... so the worst for him is he lost his bond. He's bankrupt and he can't do anything for a little while. But and we we can well we're not not involved in that sale whatsoever. Yeah. But the buyer could try to chase this guy in the courts, which is but if he doesn't have money and like he was because I I actually spoke to the agent like because. I always find that stuff interesting because you want to learn from it. And, um, you know, it was all like blaming COVID and all that kind of stuff for it. But at the end of the day, the rent was way too high. When was the when was the purchase? Do you remember? Uh, it was last year, early last year. And then it all failed sort of before mid last year, really. Okay. So it's COVID impacted. You would have been. You, you would have to argue there's probably a pretty good COVID, yep. COVID impacted. But who's buying, who's buying gyms in the middle of COVID, right? Well, yeah, well... I actually didn't mind the gym scenario because, like, gyms, I always have a long-term picture. Like, you know, we were talking every month during COVID, and um, I like the, the the actual benefit we got out of COVID. We got the gyms at better prices because everyone was going, oh, gyms are dead forever. Mm. Uh, good gyms are all up and running and going stronger as strong as ever, really. Um, I'm more worried about the extra competition they're going to get from other competing gyms. That's more of an issue. COVID was always going to be come and go. But yeah. But yeah, if you've got a seven-year lease and you can't afford the rent, that's fatal. well. You see, this this F forty-five is going to the wall, right? You know, which it was just a, a business for selling franchises. Um, mm. You know, and there's a lot of people who kind of blow their dough on that. And most of those S forty-fives are in smaller, two hundred square meter um, mum and dad type uh, investments, right? You know, I'd, yeah. I'd like to know how many people have invested in in uh, locations which has an F forty-five in it, and whether or not they're getting yeah. getting their rent check each month. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And think about what their competitive advantage is. So mm. things like Anytime Fitness, a lot of the other big gyms are going 24 hours now. So their model, like I'm not in the gym industry, I've got no idea how, how it goes, but common sense tells you they're going to have more threats than potentially, I don't know, a world gym or, you know, one of the big boys who offer, you know, a slightly different product, a more wholesome or you know, basically just a bit. It's hard to have a point of difference in gyms these days, right? Yeah. You know, they can only have the next gimmick, right, which might be F25 or, <laughs> you know. I reckon a good idea for a gym is just fill a gym full of dirt and gravel and, like, clay and just give people pickaxes and and, and, uh, and spades and just go dig holes, you know. <laughs> if you want a gym, go and do that sort of stuff. Anyway. Next momentum media. Ne- next, uh, there you go, yeah. The next, ne- <laughs> the next venture. So, so that's going pretty bad, right? So how do you remedy this? You've either got to reset the rent to a place – and a point where you can um and the big question around who owns the fit out also right you know that's yep. another big issue so to fix something like that um the best or just problem solving you go how can i get the same rent well you're going to probably have to split it up so you look at maybe trying to get smaller tenancies going um i'd, I'd run multiple ads so you do one for the whole size and then look if it makes sense to split it twice or three times have individual smaller ads that's what you know a lot of the um a lot of the big guys like um, Center Group do. They just have you know sizes between X, Y, and Z, and mm. um, and just try get different tenants in. Whoever comes first, just take them. Um, that's that's what I do, and and just get it on the market. Leasing is going to be harder at different times of year. So leasing right now is is not good. If you're like we're in November now, it's gonna it's gonna be tough to find a tenant before Christmas. So leasing activity generally starts kicking up mid February. Mm. So you know, if you can kind of string a previous tenant along for a few extra months, get them over that Christmas hurdle, it's it's definitely a smart option. But um, yeah, you just got to be a little bit careful trying to uh, go before Christmas because the vacancies will will last, and then your ad gets a little stale. So how how um let, let's just say for example, it's three hundred square meter gym, right? Which is probably about maybe about right, and it's going to have dunnies and all that sort of stuff in the services. If you go okay, I'm going to turn it into three one hundred square meter shops whatever it might look like homewares a a hairdresser whatever else you want to do like there's a fair bit of work to split that up right like you can market it saying this is what you can do and you can 
And it's, if you get a bite on that and someone goes, yeah, I want one of them or I want two of them, you're going to go and start doing the work. But to actually do the fit-out works on that with services, you know, different meters, different um, uh, plumbing capabilities, you start messing around with that and you've got to start complying to different rules which have come in, like you might need to put disabled toilets in and all that sort of stuff. Things can get really pricey, right, if you start changing things up. Yeah, definitely. And and you've just got to remember in these dark times if you're going through this, like it's probably a one in a 10 year type event. Mm. Like I was talking to someone the other day about the the whole vacancies, you know, when you deal with residential, you, you might have four weeks vacancy every year. So over a 10 year period, you're getting 40 weeks cumulative total. So commercial, your tenant will generally stay five, 10, 15 years. So let's say you're lucky, you get them for 10 years and you've got three, four months vacancy. Overall, it's you it's almost well. the same as residential. It's just mm. all in one hit. Yeah. And human nature will make you, you know, if you're a panicker and you've seen three months of no inquiries and ads, it, it does not feel good. You know, if you've gone through it before, you probably don't care too mm. much. It's just all part and parcel because, you know, once you land that tenant, you might have them for the next decade. So you just got to remember a lot of it's just mindset. You just spend the money if you have to. If you can, if you don't, you just got to leave it as is and just get lucky on the market. Um it's not a bad time to lease a property at the moment. The um, vacancy rates are, are tightening, even mm. for office at the moment, but industrials as tight as it possibly can. And Mate, you, you say that. I was just down in um, uh, one of those Bangaroo Towers, uh, International Tower number three, like an hour or so ago, and I, I looked out uh, at International Tower number two. Most people know the, the towers I'm talking about down in Bangaroo in, the, um, uh, in, in Sydney, and mate, I counted about 20 floors with no one in it. There was just workstations with not a body on it, no lights on. And I was sitting there going, God, you know, you've got these organisations blowing a lot of money on rent in these places where no one is. And then you've got obviously the carbon footprint around if you want to get sort of environmental around it all with these these offices which are there and no one's in them or they're still burning power. But then the asset manager, the asset owner is is collecting rent on this stuff, Right. With, with no occupancy, and that, that can't last forever, right? Like, it's it's concerning. And this is probably another possible what could go wrong with commercial. So that's a really good point. These towers are generally owned by REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. You Can know, you just explain what that is for our listeners that don't know what a REIT is? It's basically a giant formal syndicate run with an AFSL, Australian Financial Service Licence. A lot of them are listed on the stock exchange, like Stockland, um, Centuria, uh, all those types of big companies. Now, the issue they're going to have in the next five years is they remember that they, they promised you know five, six, seven percent returns, cash mm. on cash. So that's not that great. You to know, the investors in the REITs. Yep. Yep. Now the interest rate rises have come up. And super funds are owned. If you've got super, you've probably got a lot of money tucked away in something like this, by the way. Yep. A retail or industry fund. Now, the risk I see with this model is they rely on very bullish and regular valuations and they're top heavy. At the moment, because they've kind of assumed these, you know, high occupancy rates. Like you're mentioning, you can see them; they're not actually occupied, and they've kind of valued it as it's completely full of people, and they're at sharp cap rates, and also the um, they're not really promising great returns versus the risk now. So there's potentially more people not wanting to invest. So it's going to be harder to fuel that moving forward until there's either a lot of rent growth, but it can't happen when vacancies are high. Industrial will be different. Neighborhood shopping centers will be different. But these office towers, like how can you keep pushing rents up when vacancy rates are high? Plus, I saw numerous cranes in the sky still, so they're still building more supply. I just think there's headwinds for these big big companies. Like the valuations are not matching what, what they are, should be on the ground potentially. And, and the issue is is that the, the, the people who are impacted by that, you have direct investors in REITs, but uh, your your super funds or the you know, institutional money is what's propping up a lot of these these large, large real estate uh, investment plays. So guess what? Aussies aren't getting a return on their super if they've, if they've maxed out inside of or they've got a particular fund that spends a lot of money inside of these um, type of products. So maybe it's time to look at a self-managed super fund. Do it yourself. Buy a residential shopping centre, right? Yeah. Oh, look, I think controlling it yourself is is a much better option. And my main reason for it is that there's less fees. So when mm. you put money into a, a Australian real estate investment trust, you normally – it might be a one or two percent acquisitions fee at the start, and then there might be an annual one percent or half a percent. So, that, and they normally sell the asset every seven years. So you've got seven years of that one percent plus a two percent upfront. So you're up to nine percent fees, and then a selling fee. 
So you lose 10% of your investment in fees on the whole asset value. And then on top of that, they clip you for 25% of the uh, the profits, the capital gains. Mm. So you lose another 25% of whatever the upside was. So, And this is your investment manager creaming it. They're the ones driving Ferraris, right? Yeah, it's and that's why some of these investment companies are they're as big as small banks, you know. And I've, um, I think if you set up your own little small syndicate where you're not, you know, exposed to that level of fees, um, it's okay. But yeah, I'm just basically saying the bad side of that industry is the fees. And um, but look, it's a safe investment, or well, was safe when the valuation stacked up. But what, what I say, like, it's not all doom and gloom. Like, this is a moment in time again. If interest rates drop next year, all of a sudden those vows are completely justified again and the show goes on. So that's sort of what has always happened, um, except for the GFC, but they were more highly leveraged back then, these funds. So they're a lot more conservatively uh, weighted these days. Um, so by leverage, you mean for, for our listeners that there's a lot, there was a lot more debt involved in the funds. Now there's less debt. Yeah, as a percentage of as the, percentage of the total, total asset manage. value. Yeah. yeah. Which means if it all goes wrong, it doesn't go as wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got a, a low leverage syndicate, you're probably looking okay at the moment. Mm. Highly leveraged ones, it's it's not as good. It means there's a lot of debt you're paying, right? And if your rents aren't as strong as what they are and your yep. debt repayment's going up, it's you know. Yeah. And if they're relying on the vow to be five, ten percent higher next year. To reprice to, it to keep their debt at a reasonable level. It's gonna be hard for them. Yeah, there you go. Well there's lots of moving parts there. That's uh more so getting into the insto um, uh, commercial property acquisitions and, and and largely you know this podcast for you know not institutional money it's for private money is that people sort of doing it themselves or inside a super fund or small little uh, tie up when people club up and create their own syndicate to, to buy commercial property so you've given us one example of it going wrong like wrong wrong what what have you got something like that you see all the time which is just not a, it's an asset not performing very well and you might not realize it maybe you can answer that to to my original point scott which was commercial property doesn't look as good today as what it did 6 months ago and a lot of people will be thinking this how do you how do you sort of calibrate that again you're going to say it's just a moment in time no doubt but how do you calibrate that well it doesn't look as good and no asset class does at the moment because it basically interest rates are causing more well, the cost of money is going up so your margins are going to be thinner so it's not good for business it's not good for people buying their first residential property it's not good for anyone but yeah. it's getting hopefully it'll get the inflation under control because that's not good either and that inflation has caused huge issues um notable the most noticeable one you'll notice is if you get an insurance bill this year versus next year they're all going up like 20, 30, 40%. So that actually eats your margin away if you're on a gross lease um, or your poor, poor tenant's going to cop a massive bill. Instead of it being 15 grand, it might be 25, 30,000 this year. So that you could imagine talking to your tenant and say, oh, look, sorry, you're on a net lease. You pay all my out- outgoings. But fortunately, insurance has gone up and we're, we see this every day. Every time we buy a property, the owner goes, oh, that insurance you got's overquoted you should talk to my guy he'll get you a better deal but it's it's a underinsured property which you know he's missed the building replacement value and it's it's a dodgy insurance bill that won't even pay you out so mm. to do it properly it's going to cost more and um that's a management issue more so but you won't deal you're, you've got a strata cost but your strata will go up next year for your tenant in your property because the insurance is probably going to go up 30 40%. Yeah. And and that's, you know, and you think about this as a if you're a, a tenant in commercial property versus an investor in commercial property of which I'm both. Um if you're a tenant, you know, you want to do deals where you just pay a, a, a percentage of the increase in the outgoings rather than a percentage of the outgoings, right? Like that's when you baseline, that's when you negotiate hard at the front of it. But there will be a lot of people who are buying commercial assets with with leases like that in it, so even though there's a big jump in um, the the quantum of these uh, regular payments, you could probably only garnish a little bit of it from the actual tenant. You're going to get hit, right? You know, and which makes your commercial investment look even worse than what 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 it, what it currently does. Um, so the point I made was that you know, and I, I think about a you know the the property that we use as an example on this show, uh, Scott, the one that you guys helped me buy out in Perth. It was about a million bucks. I think it put forty grand in my back pocket every month. Uh, sorry, every year uh, when it all washed through. Uh, that's a very different number now, rather than being a I can't, two and a half grand a uh, a month um, interest repayment. It's like four thousand seven hundred bucks now, right? So it's eroding it quickly. So 
do I just go, yeah, it's just the way it's going to be for a little while. It's not costing me yet. Um, I'm still positive rather than negative, but what needs to happen for that to become a negative asset? So, and this, so by the way, that asset sits inside my super fund where my superannuation contributions need to start paying for the upkeep of a current property I have. So I'm essentially going backwards. Yeah. So look, if rates got to say eight, because you put cash down in that deal, you'd need your rates to be about 9% for that to be negative. Mm. Um, if that happens, I think we've got bigger problems than, um, and you still wouldn't sell because it'd probably be the one, one property just treading along, but all the others will be massively negative. And, mm. you know, I, I think this is a time you just buckle down, get through the next, you know, six, 12 months, whatever it is, because what we're seeing now is actually worse on the tenants than the owners. Like, we're, yeah, sure, our margins are gone. You know, instead of making ridiculous money on the cash flow, you're now making modest. And a lot of this is going to get passed back onto your tenants and whether it's a natural CPI increase or – because one of the risks we're seeing as well is if you've got a big long lease and it's only on a 2.5 or 3% increase, it means you don't have the opportunity to increase your rents because rents are growing at, in some areas, 10 15 20% in, in some, some certain sub sectors. So you want to have the ability to change the rent mm. on the tenant because that will get your margin back into it. And the longer this all happens, you know, the better it is. Like it's, you know, we're not looking at the P and L's just for this year because they're not going to be as good as they were last year. Um, but again, it's, it's like the tide just slowly comes in. Those rents will keep creeping up. Your leverage will, you know, stay the same. Your asset value will go up every time the rent goes up. So, you know, don't think you like. You, there's going to be less people retire this year because you need to keep keep the income. And you just in. need to accept that because it's the market that's done it. It's not yourself, right? Yeah. You know? And we've all lived through markets like this before. It's it's a different type. I was a lot more fearful in the early days of COVID because that I felt rents were dropping. I mm. thought the tenants wouldn't have the ability to pay the rent. For me as an investor, that was scary. This is. I'm I'm very comfortable because I can see the tenants uh, in general on mass paying their tent and yeah, paying their rent. No, I don't know why you were worried about. It. You own Kentucky Fried Chickens, mate. <laughs> <laughs> they went through the roof, right? When COVID happened, there was more heap, more people. Yeah. The only thing you could do to get out of your house was to go and get food, right? Down and go old KFC, get a bucket. I know. You know. Well, the, the types of tenants I bought, like it changed my investor behaviour. Back, like, so the tenants I've got, I've got a chemist warehouse, an Audi, uh, Hungry Jacks, a KFC. Have you got an Audi? Have you? Yeah, in, in Perth. Um, okay. But there are all these recession type tenants. Like mm. it doesn't. So, because I, I always plan for these Armageddon things. You've got to think this. And right now, I've planned for this. I've got my buffers in place, and every investor needs to have that. If you've redlined to get a deal done, uh, it's okay if you've got new cash flow coming in to support it. But if you haven't planned for 7% interest rates and you can't hold through for the next six, 12 months, then you've probably gone a bit too aggressive. Mm. So, this is just part of being an investor and we'll all come out of it and once the rates start dropping you know the, i think the asset values could surge and that's that's because people are going to be go, feeling like now is the best time to invest we've got this is the low point and uh time to get into a good cash flow asset still the best option out is, there is this a low point or will it get lower than where we are i think quarter one i'm only guessing but if i'm speculating as an investor i think quarter one quarter two will be the best buying periods we see in the next 10 years because- a big call. It, it just feels like that because it is is cool right now. Like it's the, the last month since we did the last podcast, it's definitely got quite a last interest rate. It, you can feel people's purse strings are tightening. Yeah. The, the first yeah, few I reckon years, it is as well. You're starting to see it, right? People are starting now to question some yep. spending, right? Um, and wait till Christmas goes through, everyone's spent on presents and all that kind of stuff. And you're going to feel like- um, People have spent money on Christmas holidays. Like I think it's going to get tighter. And there's all the, the tech wipeout at the moment, the mm. Bitcoin wipeout. So there's a lot of wealth that's evaporated in the world yeah. in the last month. Yeah. Well, how do you so, feel about your portfolio? You, you got a, you're currently in love with your portfolio or is it a bit of a, a, bit of a nuisance? Uh, look, we, I sat down with the wife late the other night. We're going, all right, we've got to work out what all the numbers are doing. And, and it was really frustrating to the point we've realized so many of the agents are not pushing the rents where they should up they're not like some rent we haven't been checking as closely as we should commercial or resi the resi stuff you got to be honest the commercial has been a bit trickier because a lot of them are new purchases and for some reason we've found a lot of the commercial agents are more stretched so and but you can't really affect changes to your commercial rent if you're on a long-term lease right 
you know, you're, you're, you're locked in, right? Yeah, but they haven't even put certain CPI increases through automatically or- Oh, they're just missing them. Just totally missing them. And these are big rents. Like, you know, some tenants paying three, 400 grand a year, one tenant. And you just think, oh, that was four months ago. What, what have you been doing? So what are they saying? They're all same excuses. They've just got excuses. So we're actually but, now- But you go, hang on a second. You, you, you've been able to receive the rent and take your fee from that every month and you can find time to do that, but- you've forgotten to increase mine by the CPI or 4% or whatever it is. Yeah. It was very frustrating. It mm. was like, we were literally just going, what the hell has been happening? You know, and did you think they were good commercial agents before that? Uh, I did. There is a, like everything, there's sometimes a difference between the really good sales agent in that business and then you're dealing with the rental department. Which, which is a hard job to be fair. Like, you know, it's-, it's And they're massively short staff. Yeah. I don't struggling. blame them. Well, I spoke to- um. He's left now, but he was the, the former pre- president, I think it was the president of the Real Estate Institute of Australia. And he's like, you know, on resi, like they're like 10,000 property managers short of what yep. they need to service what they have right now. Like, you know, that's mad. Like they're yep. really, really short staffed. And that's the problem, I think. They're like, I'm, I ask a question because we mentioned last podcast looking into things like solar panels. So we want to get the bills from the tenants. You know, we ask the manager, oh, get the bill. Another week passes, another week passes, three follow-ups. Where's the bill? Oh, sorry. I haven't got around to it. And you think, just, just get it. So this is this is things going wrong, really. It's not like wrong, wrong, yep. because it's not like you're, you're, you're blowing your dough, but it's their administrative headaches, which, number one, negatively frame your attitude towards commercial property investing, which isn't a good thing. And sometimes you go, it's too hard. Or it costs you more money because you've got to work out how do you fix it. Like you've got to pay for someone to do it all. Yeah. You know, but that's what you pay the commercial, the irony is that's what you pay the commercial property manager for, to work for you on your behalf. Yeah. And look, maybe it's just been a frustrating couple of months because everyone's stretched. Because like one of the things I've always thought about commercial, and it has been true in general, is it's a lot easier to manage because you mm. deal with one lease, it's a business type tenant. It is better, but there's just a lot of change in the industry. Like people are so stretched and- it's just, it's a management issue. That's all it is. It's not a money thing, but it will be for us because we've now realized it's probably now time to actually hire someone full time because we've got 54 tenants in amongst our properties. And then some of them are complex tenants with very detailed leases and that. So, yeah, my, yeah that's a lot of tenants, mate. And we're like, we're just going through spreadsheets. And this is not something I want to do with my. Day to day life. You love spreadsheets. I know you love spreadsheets. You used to love spreadsheets. <laughs> Not when it's like this is the rent and this is what we received, and just yeah. trying to like manually audit it. It's it's. Not nice work, right? No. No. And you've got to like find stuff and yeah. Yeah, I hate it. I always put it off. So I think, yeah, bookkeeper time just yeah. to sort all that out because, um, yeah, you don't want to be left 20 grand short and never know about it. And that's, that's, that's probably happening, right? But that's it going wrong. You know, that's yep. that's leakage, right? Like, yep. where's my 20 grand? Yep. But so on that basis then, if if you're 20 grand short, um, someone's received the money somewhere. So is that, you know, or it's just really not the CPI stuff getting involved, the rent increase getting passed on, right? And it's not good for the tenant when they get a bill that says, oh, yeah, we missed this six months ago. you you got to pay us back this much. Yeah, look, on that note, I have found they are pretty decent because, mm. like, the legal lease agreement is they've got to pay it. So yeah. um, it's still just, it's just like admin error frustration. And um, But, look, they do generally pay. I think if you did it with residential, it's a lot different because there's more of that month-to-month living yeah. that you'll get with a, you know. A- Why don't you just sell everything then? Just sell how many fifty something tenants? That's a lot of tenants, mate, in a lot of different locations. Just sell everything. Well, if you look at just what sell, happens, get, in- get rid of the lot, <laughs> <laughs> pay a big tax bill. Well, this is a good bit. Like we've got about sixty four mil in, mm. in property. So if that grows ten percent in the next two years, you know you make six point four mil. That's another property you can leverage and then buy a ten million dollar property for doing nothing. It's it feeds itself, and that's that sounds like a real first world problem you've got there, mate. <laughs> But look, you get to it, you'd know this, your portfolio, like we spoke a few months ago, like you've got this size where literally you are creating deposits to the point where you don't even care anymore to use them. But that's the beauty of property. You leverage. And I, I'm a big believer currency is just going to keep devaluing across the world as long as I live. It's just going to get less and less valuable because they keep printing it. And there's an unlimited supply of it. So you've got to hedge your bets. And I'm done with the stock market as much as I get tempted with everyone's hot tips but you know uh, you know you think about the buildings all these stock market companies are in you know they 
the companies will go and come many times over in decades. Some will last 100 years, but most don't. But the buildings are always there. And I just like that longevity of a good quality building and it will outlast me. And that's the beauty of it. And you just sort of run at lower debt levels in time. And yeah, that's that's why you play these games. And that's why thousands of people, it's, it's the way for the middle class to get out of the middle class and retire, I think. It's the only easy way to property. using property, you know, un- unless you start a business or do something, you know, crazy mm. like that. And get so lucky. Get lucky. Get lucky. Well, it's, it's, it's pretty sensible stuff, uh, what you're saying there, mate. Um, you know, uh, you've got a big portfolio, right? Most commercial investors, oh, look, I'm sure there's heaps of family offices that got a lot more of it, but you've got a complicated property portfolio that needs love and attention, right? So a, a lot of people will be sitting here listen to you going, oh, poor Scott. It's got to look at spreadsheets, right? But, you know, this is a podcast for commercial property investors. So most people who tune in this would be going, oh, how do I emulate this bloke? You know, and that's that's the reason why we do this because it's not all easy. Um, and property, particularly commercial property, is not a passive investment, particularly if your portfolio gets big, resi or commercial. It becomes less passive and it becomes a full-time job. So you've got to work out – Where's the best way for you to deploy your time, energy, and effort? Is it doing spreadsheets and bookkeeping type work, or is it out there sort of strategically shuffling the decks of your portfolio and working out what's next, keeping connected with the market, doing this sort of stuff, right? And I'd argue that's probably where you need to be. But there is solutions, to your point, to most problems um, and most issues you're facing in commercial investing. It's only when things go really wrong that you can be stuck between a rock and a hard place. But typically, that's when there's a buyer's agent sitting there in the wings looking to snap up yeah. a distressed property, right? And you guys like to operate there as well. Exactly. And, and I'm really highlighting the negatives right now. Mm. And, that, like, and, and it's because I've probably had more troubles in the last month than we had in the last three years. It's just because there's changeover of tenants. It, like maybe the- It's cyclical. It always happens like that. It's always like there's no problems and then it's just like everything is wrong. Yeah. So, you know, our solution is changing managers. At the moment, we're just consolidating the good ones to take over more of our current properties. But we are in the background just going, well, we can't manage this. We don't want the responsibility to have to audit the portfolio because it is just, it's it's a, it's an accountant's job and um, there's no real value we're adding to it besides- Mate, This sounds horrible, right? I get rental statements and again, it's a first world problem and I go- that looks a bit small. I'm talking resi, right? No, even commercial. I get commercial stuff and I go, oh, that's a bit weird. I get resi stuff and I go, that's a lot less than what I think it should be. Like, what's happened here? I've got no idea. And I call them up and they go, oh, yeah, um, they're putting your hot water system in because of this. And I go, oh, I don't remember that. And they go, well, yeah, we spoke to you about it. And you said, do it, right? And I go, oh, okay, all right, fine. You know, so, it, but, but it goes wrong. Something that you did that you told me, which is really good because your accountant, Munzrill, yeah, he told me he went through all your properties and actually did a P&L, like proper like business statement on it so you can work out the exact cash flow each of them. Mm. So few people do that. Yeah, my, you should see my property spreadsheet. Like he, An accountant would be impressed and I'm just a, a journalist, but, mate. Yeah. yeah, but it's brilliant. Now, then you can make calls on properties go, yeah, that, that's just been treading water for, you know, it helps you sell properties and not just go, oh, buy and hold forever because that's not... A solution. If you got two hundred grand trapped in a dud, get it out and just put it as cash, or, yeah. or go buy a better property somewhere. Well, you know, it's one of the strategies that I'm uh, doing right now. I'm, I'm just I'm stacked up in offsets, right? Just waiting for that moment in time that you spoke about, which I think, which I completely agree with you. I think there's going to be some pretty good buying late Q3, Q4 of this financial year, so March through to June. Yep. Um, so you've got money parked in offsets. If you've got resi stuff or or even if it's your owner occupier, right, um, you're not paying any interest on it. You're paying a lot less, right? So you're getting 5% on your money and it's liquid yep. sitting there waiting. It's 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 good um, perpetual energy you can deploy yep. uh, when you're ready in time. So, you know, good luck getting sort of 5% on your money at the moment in a liquid investment. You can spend it, spend it tomorrow. That's pretty good going. So if you're not doing that, I'd highly suggest you do it. Exactly. Year. Yeah, and yeah, I think um, that's just advice. Like, do what you've done. You get your account to actually run. And I'm trying to get um, mine the same because we've been having our own manual spreadsheets. But have an account signed off one. Yeah, you know, like a business. Like that's what we do with our business. It's why don't we do it? Because you you might do it yourself, but you 
might have something wrong in it. You know what? You want some boffin who knows what they're doing to not yeah. that Munzerall's a boffin. He's a very smart guy. Um, but you you just want you just want to know the integrity of your um, visibility on your your property property investment portfolio is accurate yep. at any given time. Because if it's not, you're stuffed. And don't forget your depreciation allowances. Oh like, God, you yeah, know, it's got that's hard to put in a spreadsheet. You know, and monitor it because remember it devalues over. Like it's just a. It needs to be treated properly. It's got to be treated like a business. Yeah. Absolutely. So how else do things go wrong, Scott? Are you uh, getting people calling you up? There's a question for you. And then, you know, to my point, we don't want to be merchants of doom and gloom, but we're conscious that commercial property moves in cycles. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's less than great. And it's, it's from a, a yielding point of view, it's it's a less than great environment now than what it was uh, in a period prior. But um, are people calling you up now going, clients going, oh, Scott, mate, this isn't as good as what it was a year ago. What's going on? How do you answer that? In all honesty, we haven't had any. There's no no regrets of buying zero because we're all long term investors. We all know these rates are going up. If anything, it's highlighted the strength of commercial because it's still positively geared. So to to still get that income even after all this, it's you know you know we're looking at some some of these guys buying four or five million dollar holiday homes, you know, in the central coast and stuff like that. Imagine you've leveraged when the interest rates were two percent off your Sydney property, then buy a four million dollar holiday home. Yeah. You've, Which are both going down in value now. You're, you're losing huge cash flow because your your mortgage has gone up three times, and mm. and you've lost value. Like that's a horror story. Well, you've lost value twice, right? Because you know you, you've you've refinanced. You've had ec- heaps of equity in your your principal place of residence. You refinanced it, maybe up to eighty percent, and that property's come back twenty yep. percent. You know, so you're potentially in negative equity on your principal place of residence, and the same thing applies on said second residence, right? Like that's bad. Exactly. And this is the key point. Time will fix it, by the way, exactly. if you can hold the line. Exactly. But the key point is all these other investments have done a lot worse, including the stock market, commercial than commercial. Commercial's still, even in these bad times, held its own. Mm. It's not flying 10, 20% growth like it was, and you're getting 4% margins on the you know, in, you know, rent versus the interest rate cover. It's tightened it, but it's still a lot better than everything else out there. So we're seeing our investors almost double down in commercial. Like we're still purchasing forty a month. That's okay. That's normal. Well, what sort of stuff are you buying? Tell me about that. Small shopping centre. What time? How long we've we been going for? About forty-five minutes. And fifty minutes. Right? I want to know about this. Small shopping centres. Small shop. So our briefs, the most common, are small shopping centres, three to eight mil. That type of stuff. That's for your guys spending a bit more. And the cash money buyers or the leverage buyers. Generally, forty percent cash. So they'll sixty percent lend yeah. on those, um, and lenders are happy to sort of throw in for that sort of asset every day of the week. They're yeah. going so hard for loans because the volumes of commercial banks are lower now, so they're really needing to make quotas. So they're basically going, "I'll charge you no application fee. I'll you know f- fight for whatever I can. I'll give you like the rates are higher, but there's no other. So you can e- shop hard, right? Like you've got a good broker, shop hard. Right? Yeah. Which lenders are most interested in commercial lending at the moment? What you're seeing most aggressive. Out of the majors and NAB and Combank, mm. I, I looked at both in my last purchase, and yeah, they they were literally calling three times a day because I started chasing, you know, you. chasing. yeah, because I they knew what I told them I was going I was looking at two different banks and it, they got desperate. It was kind of funny, so I said, "Oh no, keep chipping it away. Um, what's this five grand application fee? Get rid of that." And they they just wiped everything, and yeah, they they were like, "All right, we'll we'll look after your other pro-. like they're just." It's See, like, that, mate, that's completely different song sheet they're singing to. Mm. You know, a year ago they wouldn't want to talk to you. They're like, oh, you, yeah, because right. their volumes are lower, yeah. so they need to make their quota to turn profit. So it's a mm. good sign if the banks are healthy and need your. And, and this is the point, though. We're, we're talking about good buying conditions coming up, and there's a reason for that. And there's probably two sides of it. Number one is um, supply and demand for commercial properties is probably and, and valuations have come down, so good time to buy. But also. Banks are happy to lend, yep. and you need those two things side by side. But you've got to have the confidence to back Australian business, though, as part of this. Because remember, if you're investing in commercial property, you're you're investing in the prosperity of commercial Australia. So that's I think the, the economy's sort of going okay. A lot of inflationary problems and concerns and pressures. Yeah, the minute you don't invest in property for commercial is when you think that rents are going to drop. That's for me the time to sit out. So mm. right now we're, we've been very positive, saying yet. Yeah, exactly the reasons you mentioned time to get in but when you see there's a sharp drop coming in rents like let's say there's a massive gfc coming up business is failing unemployment's going up Mm. sit on the sidelines 
because that's not a good time to get in. So you're not on the sidelines at the moment? No, the closest I got was in 2020 when because we didn't know what was happening. When we started this podcast. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was a bit nerve-wracking, but, but the thing that helped was the interest rates were so low that mm. it just made mathematical sense. Like, you, you know, you're getting a 7% yielding property and you're getting a 3% loan. It had to work, and it did. We were right. Like, things skyrocketed, and now we're in a different phase. The margins are tighter, but we're in a rent growth phase. So yeah. that gives me confidence at least the next five years are going to be good. So if we're talking about a rent growth phase, and, and if you have a commercial lease in place, it means it's pegged. Typically, there'll be some sort of um, uh, option to extend it over time at the commercial rate. So how far before a lease expiring, it might be a five-year lease or whatever it is expiring, should you start negotiating on that new lease? Because you might want to punt the tenant, right, if they're not going to um, come up with the with the rent, which is market. Uh, there's two ways to do it. You just sneak it up on them and just mm-hmm. go, oh, your rent's up. Guess what? Here's your market rate quick and they're going to panic and go look around and realize they can't find a, another lease. Yeah. Um, but if you're really fearful they're going to actually leave and you need time to plan it, chat with them early and that, that will give you the option to potentially put a side ad online because sometimes that's what you've got to do to, to get the tenant over the line. Yeah, okay. Go, all right, well, you're not signing this lease. Well, guess what? I'm going to have to put a sign up in front of your property. Yeah. Uh, and that helps sometimes. And they don't want to see a thing out the front saying four leads. The people go, oh, what, the business going bust? Is yeah, that, is that it's calling their bluff. You know, yeah. if, if they're going to move, they're going to move, and that will speed them up. If they're going to stay and they're just trying to play. The, the, the thing is that the same thing applies in Brizzy. I had a place up in Brizzy, and it was way under market rent. And I said, what's the market rent? And I sort of pushed it up to where it was, and which was comparatively as a percentage quite quite a lot. It was like maybe a 35 40% increase right in the rent. And the tenants went, no, we're leaving. And I went, fine. And um, we put an advert up, and they looked around and worked out that, that they're probably getting a good deal. And they went, "Okay, we decided to stay." It's, it's, it's the same logic, right? Exactly. You the just same. got to play the game. So it's no different. You just got to be a little bit more on on the technical comparable sales. So hit them up with a spreadsheet showing this is what all your other neighbours are paying, because mm. you're not trying to rip anyone off, but you can't be ripped off either. Yeah, and that's it. It's got to be fair market rent. And if it's fair market rent, that's all okay. Whatever is in the contract is the way it should be. But um, anyway, that's quite a long podcast. Hope you uh, enjoyed that, everyone. Um, it's good to. I don't want to say it's a contrarian view towards uh, a commercial property investment, but it's probably a realistic and pragmatic, practical view uh, today. And uh, as I said at the top end, it's not all beer and skittles. I don't even know what that. That's American term, isn't it? Um, uh, what's the Australian term of that? It's not always a she'll be right. It's not always she'll be right in commercial property. Yeah, I don't know. On the top of the something list. like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, thanks, Scott. So, what's next for us? We um, we're going to see each other again before uh, the uh, what do you call it? Christmas break and the and the new year. What what do we want to talk about next month? Uh, probably what? keen to get. So, I might get a, another guest in. Okay. Um, we'll see. Like, I've got, I've got a, a lot of people that still want to get on. So maybe that. But if um, the listeners just want to email through at info at rethinkinvesting dot com dot au, just topics. Mm. Um, you know, even this topic comes from someone just mentioning, oh yeah, tell us what goes wrong. You know, yeah. so we're listening to what you guys are saying, and um, we can talk for the next ten years on this type of stuff. So it's good to be targeted, and yeah. um, you guys can help. Maybe we should get a count on at some point, right? Yeah, you know, that'd be good. Come on over yarn, see what's going on. You know, um, maybe some real estate agents they give us the real dirt on the trickery that happens inside of commercial leasing. Someone who wants to, uh, yeah, warts and all type stories. Yeah, we we, we went video and we can put a funny voice over them and uh, put that little black thing over their eyes, right? But um, anyway, uh, go and check these guys out. Rethink Investing, just Google them and uh, you'll track them. Then you guys like can people actually get in front of you before Chrissy? You got capacity? Yeah, yeah. Just reach out. Like we're um, we're always. Saying there's a small waiting list, but that's that's just due to the supply of properties. But um, yeah, you want to talk to us? We can plan next year and yeah, uh, yeah. get yourself ready in for this good buying period. That's uh, it'll be around for a while. There's no big rush, and that's that's the big key. You don't need like we've got a lot of people that are quite impatient because that you know people want to get into the market, and you don't you're not missing out if you're not in this month. Yeah. You know, you get in get in next month or the month after. Like, so just take it easy, relax, and it'll yeah. be okay. But but the uh, the Chrissy New Year's period is a good time to get your house in order. I always use it to do a bit of a, not really a spring clean, because it's the middle of summer, but um, just sort out all my admin. That's probably gone a bit uh, to the to the wane over the period. So um, a good time to do some stuff. Uh, Rethink Investing, this is Inside Commercial Property. Hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye.